All right, help me out. Welcome, Kaylin. She goes back to the bunker. She's uh, helping Hiawasi and those online, uh, make sure that you can hear. So we're so glad that you are with us. Uh, Hiawasi, maybe you're jumping in for the first time in their series. Maybe you're a new time guest with us. Maybe you're online. Uh, a lot of different ways. Or maybe you've been here through the whole series. We're in a series called Decisive Battles. Decisive Battles. And it's letting me uh, geek out, nerd out a little bit with my love with history. Okay, I was spending a, a little bit of my time off today still watching the History Channel. They love me over there. And so um, well, we're, we're continuing on. We're going through a series on how to win decisive battles in our life today, spiritually. Okay, and so I hope the series has been helpful with you so far. We're going to dive in today. I want to bring up a moment in history. A moment in history. It's February 23rd, 1836. There's about... 200 or so men, they've been surrounded in an old Spanish mission in Texas. Some of you may have heard this story before, but on February 23rd, 1836, the battle for the Alamo began. Farmers, doctors, and some Tennessee frontiersmen who had got tangled up in the wrong fight had been fighting Santa Ana and his troops fighting for the independence of Texas. And they'd gotten themselves surrounded at the Alamo. They looked over the walls. They were completely surrounded. They were completely outnumbered. By most historian estimates, it was at least five to one. They were outnumbered and outgunned. You may ask, well, what in the world are they doing there? They believed in something. They believed in independence. And it caused people from Tennessee and farmers and doctors to come all in one moment together in an old, old situation of the, uh, the Spanish mission. It was never designed to be a fort. It was never designed for a last stand. But on February 23rd, it had to do. And so Santa Ana sent wave after wave, day after day, at the men inside the Alamo, and, and they repelled each attack. This went on for days, and it turned into to weeks until finally... The final attack took place before dawn on March 6th. Santa Anna had had enough after losing time and time again, and he ordered an all-out assault. Every last man he had was ordered to charge the Alamo before dawn. They broke through the meager excuse for walls that the Texans had. The fighting, they say, lasted about 90 minutes, some of it hand-to-hand combat at the end. Their leaders, Bowie, and Travis, James Bowie, you may have heard of him for this nice company, William Travis, and even the legend Davy Crockett was there. They were all killed. Every last one fought to the end, but against the odds, they were not able to prevail in the moment. There was only a few survivors at the end of it all, mostly women and children who Santa Anna allowed to go. After the battle, Santa Ana took his troops and marched east. And it was tough news for a man named Sam Houston to swallow. Sam Houston was the general over all the Texan forces. And he was actually the general who was receiving letters and updates from the Alamo begging for reinforcements. Begging for someone to come help the men inside. Because they knew if they were not reinforced, they would not last. And Sam Houston had to receive update after update knowing he was not able to go to their aid. He needed more time to rally troops, to build his cause, to make a stand. So even after the Alamo, Santa Ana goes after Houston, chasing him around. And Houston's always on the run, trying to gain more and more people to his cause. And then finally, on April 21st, Sam Houston decides he's ready. Sam Houston leads the Texas forces, and they surprise Santa Ana, who's grown quite confident. He's destroyed the Alamo, he's kept Sam Houston on the run, and they're on top of the world. And then one morning, the Texas forces surprise Santa Ana's camp, and you hear crying out as they charge the camp, remember the Alamo. Remember the Alamo. See, the Texas forces knew that this moment where they're charging Santana would have never happened without all the time that those men bought them in the Alamo. 
They rally, cry out, remember the Alamo as they charge through the camp, and the fighting lasts just mere minutes. Santa's Anna and his army were so caught off guard that they were done in quickly. And just like that, independence was won for the Texans, but not without a heavy cost. See, here's the thing. There's no such thing as believing in something without a cost. There's no such thing as believing in something without a cost. See, the men inside the Alamo, when they looked over the poor excuse for walls they had and saw themselves surrounded, looking out at the army they were facing, you had to wonder, why am I here? Why am I here? What am I doing in an old Spanish fort that doesn't even have four walls? What am I doing here? And it was a belief in independence. And that very belief ended up costing them ultimately their life. Do you believe in anything that costs you? Do you believe in anything that costs you? See, if you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, does it cost you anything? Does it affect the way you live your life yearly, monthly, weekly, even daily? You see, I want you to write this down. There's no such thing as following Jesus without a cost. There's no such thing as following Jesus without a cost. Matthew 16, verse 24 through 26, it's Jesus talking. It says in verse 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone, if you've got your Bible or a Bible app or anything, I want you to highlight and under the word, underline the word anyone. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You see, in verse 24, I love the word anyone. I love the word anyone. Jesus says, if anyone. It's the most broad invitation there is. There's no anyone but. You see, I think some of us, hear that invitation, we go, yeah, Jesus invites anyone but me. See, the verse doesn't say, if anyone but Philip in all of his mistakes. The verse doesn't say, if anyone but you in all of your sin. The verse doesn't exclude any of us. Jesus said, if anyone, anyone in your sins, anyone in your mistakes, anyone in your failures, if anyone wants to follow me, they can, but but then comes the standard. See, some of us, if we're, we're honest with ourselves, we think Jesus doesn't want us because of what we've done. The invitation doesn't apply to us. The standard to get to Jesus is too high for you and I to get there. But that's not what the verse says. Jesus says there's literally nothing stopping you from being the anyone who follows me. But if you are going to follow me, there's a cost. If you are going to follow me, there is a cost. See, for the men in the Alamo, their fight for for independence cost them their very life. They could have left, they could have tried to negotiate a truce, but they refused because of what they believed in. For us, when it comes to following Jesus, are we willing to deny ourselves? When it comes to following Jesus, do we believe enough that we're willing to pick up a cross and follow him? When we believe in Jesus, are we willing to lose our life to find it in him? See, there's no such thing as following Jesus without a cost. When 182 or so men in the Alamo looked over their bleak excuses for walls at the enemy troops that were going to eventually destroy them, they understood the cost. They looked and made a decision that we believe in independence enough to stay here and fight, regardless of what it costs us. When you and I decide to follow Jesus, are we willing to deny ourselves? Are we willing to pick up a cross and follow him? Are we willing to lose our life to find it in Jesus? Jesus says, if anyone, no ifs, ands, or buts, if anyone wants to follow me, they can. But if they are going to follow me, there's a cost. When it comes to giving our whole life to find it in Jesus... Can you and I look Jesus in the eye and honestly tell him, I believe, Jesus, you are worth it all? Honestly, 
If we could look Jesus in the eye, could we say, Jesus, I believe you are worth it all. Because Jesus says, if you do follow me, you'll live your life like you do believe that. There is a cost to following me. Honestly, how many of us think that this world doesn't have anything to offer in comparison to Jesus? Honestly, how many of us believe that? I'm going to ask an offensive question. I know it's offensive, and, and you may get mad. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't really care. The question is, what's your price to walk away from Jesus? What's your price to walk away from Jesus? What's your price that if you got enough of X, you would stop denying yourself? Is it a certain job title or position? If you got high enough at your company, you would stop denying yourself. Or if you just got that relationship you're looking for, I'll stop denying myself for Jesus. Or if I got enough money or fame or whatever it is, if I got enough of something this world can offer me, I will no longer deny myself for Jesus. How many of us would follow Jesus with our cross up until a certain point and then drop it? For a price. You see, in the men in the Alamo, there was no price. Santa Anna had nothing he could offer that was going to make them lay down their weapons. When it comes to us following Jesus, do we honestly tell him, there is no price that will allow me to lay down my cross in following you? Can we honestly look Jesus in the eye and say, I believe you're worth it all? You see, the battle of the Alamo eventually became a rally cry. Remember the Alamo was heard, yelled across fields as the Texan forces stormed to win the battle for independence that day. Remember the Alamo became an infamous rally cry. But it wasn't birthed forth without a cost. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, it says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you've received from God if you're a Christian? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I think some of us either have never heard this before or it's easy to forget that each and every last one of us was bought at a price. We're not insignificant. We're not invaluable. We were bought at a price. Jesus isn't sitting up in heaven going, eh, I hope they follow me, but if they don't, I don't really care because it didn't cost me anything for them to follow me. No, Jesus is up in heaven saying, I paid it all for them. When your life and my life comes up on the auction block and the enemy says, what will you pay for them? Jesus stood up and said, everything. Everything for their life. I'll pay it all for them. You and I so many times tell ourselves we're insignificant, but Jesus says if anyone, anyone wants to follow me, they can. I've paid a price, my life, for every last person to follow me. You see, the uncomfortable truth with that, though, is it's not on Jesus anymore, then. It's on us. That's what's so uncomfortable about these verses is Jesus already died for you and me. And therefore, it means your life and my life has to answer one question. What are we going to do about Jesus? What are we going to do about Jesus? Because he already paid the price for you and I to follow him. He says, if anyone, if anyone, there's no barrier, there's nothing in between us. If anyone wants to follow me, they can. But if they are, there's a cost. You see, the men in the Alamo said, my life will be laid down for the cause of independence. Does our life say, my life will be laid down for Jesus? If people looked at our life, would they honestly be able to say, that person, that person's willing to lay their life down for Jesus? You see, we were bought at a price. 
So remember Jesus. Galatians 5, 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You ever been invited to somebody's house before? You go to their house and you're excited to meet them and you're excited to see them and, and, and they're welcoming you in the house. Come on in, come on in. We've got some chips and salsa or, you know, whatever appetizers they've got. You know, maybe if they're real fancy, they got those little like triangle sandwiches. I don't know. You know, and they, they bring you on inside and then you hear this, like this scurrying coming at you. And around the corner comes their pet and you're like, oh, you got a pet. And you make eye contact and you're like, oh my gosh, it's the most butt ugly thing you've ever seen. But they don't know that. They think Sparky, their dog, is beautiful looking. Maybe, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. I, I, I want to help you visualize this moment. So can we throw up a picture? I got a picture of a butt ugly pet for you. There we go. Let's go Gators. We can all go home now. No. <laughs> So you go over to their house and you turn the corner and Sparky comes around the corner and it looks like he got run over by a tractor. You're like, oh dear father, you're trying not to make eye contact. You're like looking at the ceiling and they're like, oh, isn't Sparky, he's just wonderful, he's beautiful. And you're like, oh, yeah, I, I think I may hurl though, you know. And so, or you know, they got one of those like shaved cats or something. The cat comes around the corner and you're like hiding your children from it. You're like, oh my gosh, you have a demon living with you. Some of us, we got ugly pets, and, and maybe at first we knew they were ugly. If we're honest with ourselves, though, you know, maybe it's only that that's the only dog or cat they had available. Maybe they just found us and we couldn't quite get rid of them. And eventually, we're okay with their ugliness. They just become part of the family. I mean, that's how you become a Bulldog fan for 20 years. Ugga finally grows on you a little bit, you know? And we start to think it's not that bad. It's not that bad looking. That's how we treat our sin sometimes. We start treating our sin like a butt ugly pet. And people can show up in our life and they immediately go, that's not good looking. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. My pride, it's just kind of cute. It's just kind of grown on me. It's just part of me. No, 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 my sexual immorality is just kind of who I am. No, no, envy, it's kind of cute. Oh, gossip, it's just always been around. And we treat our sin like it's an ugly pet. And we become complacent with it. And we become okay with it. And it's part of who we are eventually. That's not what Galatians 5.24 says to do. Galatians 5.24 in the New Philip Version says, you need to evict that ugly pet. You need to punt that thing like Baxter off the bridge. Send that thing careening. Some of us need to evict our ugly pets. We've been keeping them as part of who we are for far too long. Paul said in Galatians 5, 24, those who belong to Jesus, those who have said, I'll deny myself, I'll pick up my cross and follow you, I will lose my life to find it in you, Jesus. He says, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's potent language for Paul to say because Paul knows Jesus was crucified. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't pick those words frivolously or casually. He specifically knew the image he was invoking in that moment. He said, do not play around with sin. Your flesh, my flesh that we live in, wants to rebel against Jesus. And Paul says, crucify it. Evict the ugly pet. Have nothing to do with it. You see... Sin is not an ugly pet. It comes to kill us. It comes to destroy our life. It comes to ruin us. It comes to separate us from God. Is our commitment level to Jesus at a level where we're ready to ditch our ugly pets? Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. He was crucified for the price of those ugly pets. He was crucified for those sins that we've become complacent with. He was crucified for those things that we've become casual with. Matthew 27 through 30. Matthew 27 through 30, if the worship team wants to come back up. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. If we're honest, those are some of the most uncomfortable verses in the entire Bible. We don't talk about those verses a lot, but we should. Jesus is the one that said it. It's not some obscure verse, and you know, I give Leviticus a hard time, but you know I love the Old Testament. You know, it's got great stuff. It's not obscure things. Jesus looked human beings in the eye and said that. And here's what I don't think he's saying. I don't think all of us need to go out and cut off our right hand or gouge out our eye. What Jesus is saying, at what price are you willing to pay to deny yourself? At what point are you willing to give your life, deny yourself, pick up your cross, lose your life to find it in me? What's your price? What's your price? See, for the men in the Alamo, their price was everything. They said over those walls, Santa Anna, you will have to come in here and kill us, but we will fight to the end for our independence. Jesus is saying in these verses, with every last breath you have, fight for your independence from sin. Fight to deny yourself. Fight to pick up your cross and follow him. Fight to lose your life to find it in Jesus. Some of us have become complacent with sin. Some of us have become okay with ugly pets in our life. And Jesus says, what are you willing to do to win a decisive battle in your life? Jesus says, what are you willing to do? And see, here's the thing. If you have heard the gospel before, you know that we all need Jesus because we all fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short. None of us will ever be good enough to save ourselves. None of us will be good enough to save ourselves. That's why Jesus came and it says, bought us at a price. Many of us, I think if we're honest, we don't want to sin. I think many of us, if we're honest, we don't want to sin. But I think if we're honest, most of us aren't willing to go that far to deal with it either. As long as it's just an ugly pet, it's kind of cute almost after a while, right? Let me tell you, gossip isn't cute. Sexual immorality is not cute. Pride is not cute. Envy is not cute. Sin is not cute. It has come to kill you and it's come to kill me. It has come to separate us from the Lord eternally. And Jesus says, cut it out. It's better to enter heaven with nothing of the world than to enter hell with everything from the world. And the reality is we can't take anything with us anyway. Why are some of us clutching our ugly pets so fervently then? Why? Jesus is asking what needs to change in your life? What needs to change in my life? What needs to be removed? In the very first message of this series, we talked about win the battle before it happens. Win the battle before it happens. And that's what Jesus says. If something's causing you to stumble, cut it out. If something's causing you to sin, remove it from your life. Win the battle before it happens. Paul says in Galatians 5, 24, crucify your flesh that wants to crave the things of this world. Most of us don't want to sin, but most of us also aren't willing to go that far to deal with it. Every day we wake up, every day we wake up is the only day we can affect. You and I cannot go back and change our mistakes from yesterday. We can't affect tomorrow because it hasn't happened yet. Today is our day that you and I have to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, will I remember Jesus? Will I remember Jesus? Will I remember that I was bought with a price? Will I remember to deny myself? Will I choose to pick up my cross and follow Jesus? Will I lose my life today to find it in Christ Jesus? Is that day today? 
Remember Jesus. Living for Jesus isn't without a cost. Living for Jesus is not without a cost. So remember Jesus daily. As you walked in, you may have found this contraption sitting on your seat. You may be going, what in the world is this? It's how we're going to take communion today. It's how we're going to take communion. Inside the top of it's this poor excuse for a wafer. In the bottom of it's grape juice. I want you to open it up. online or in high walls, you're in the building, I want us to have a moment we take communion. Because Jesus, in the last season of his life, he said something interesting to those closest to him. He said something interesting to them. They were having a meal together and he took bread. And he looked at those following him he said, this bread represents my body. My body that's going to be broken for you. I think many times in our life, it's easy to forget that we were bought at a price. It's easy to forget to remember Jesus. And that's why he said before he was crucified, remember me. Remember me. I'm not going to pay a price for nothing. Remember me. And he took the bread and he told them to eat it. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And you see, it wasn't just his body that was going to be broken. He was going to bleed. And he took the wine and he told them, this, this is my blood. It's going to be poured out for you and for anyone who would come follow me. And he took the wine. He said, drink of this and remember me. Mike, if you can hit the lights for us, that'd be great. Thank you, brother. I think we all need a moment, whether you're in Hawassi or online or in the building. I think we all need to ask an honor, honest question. Is the way that I live my life remembering Jesus? Is the way that I'm living my life picking up a cross and following Jesus? It's the way that I live my life, remembering that I was bought at a price. Maybe today's a day where the Lord's been convicting you that it's time to evict some ugly pets in your life. You've walked into a movie theater in Hiawassee, you've joined us online, you've walked into the gym at a Christian school, and the fact remains it's time for you to not bring home some ugly pets with you. What needs to change in your life and my life to leave no doubt that I will deny myself, I will pick up my cross, and I will lose my life to find it in Jesus? What needs to change? Some of us have been fighting and feeling like we lose battles over and over in our life. Today's your day. Today is your day. Do you want to win decisive battles? Jesus says, if that's the case, then give everything, everything, and lose your life to find it in me. Deny yourself. Jesus says, what's got to be removed? What needs to change in our life today? But more than anything, our life 
as we head back out, whether it's from a movie theater, a gym, online, our life should clearly communicate, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. So Lord, we give you this time because Lord, we were bought at a price. You're not sitting up in heaven casually, complacently, uninterested in who we are. You came and gave your life so that anyone, anyone might follow you. So Jesus, if there's any chain, if there's any wall, if there's anything that's keeping us from you, let us crucify it. Let us cut it out. Let, it, let us remove it from our life. Holy Spirit, won't you meet us in this moment? Maybe it's come time where you want to give your life fully to Jesus. It's time that you know I need to deny myself and lose my life to find it in Jesus. You can give it to Jesus right now by telling him that. Maybe it's time where some ugly pets have become complacent. They've become part of the family. It's time for you to evict them. Now is your time. Maybe you'd like to come down front. If you're in Hiawassee, you can come down front and pray with Chris. If you're here, you can come down front. I'll pray with you. But some things have got to change. People inside this world shouldn't be able to come to our house and ugly pets meet them at the door. We either deny ourselves for Jesus or we don't. So let's live lives day in and day out that say, remember Jesus. Because there's no such thing as following Jesus without a cost. So Holy Spirit, pierce our hearts, draw us close to you, Jesus. Light a fire in our souls to do the things that you call us to, Jesus. Let us leave no doubt that you are of the greatest value to us. If you wanna come down front and pray, you can. Jesus, this time is yours. Amen.